part two, let's just refresh our memory and see what we needed to find. Part two, determine the interval that the particle moves through and the maximum speed of the particle. Okay, now there's a few ways to go about this. Uh, let's do maximum speed first because I actually think it's most uh, straightforward, right? How do I find maximum speed? Well, I can actually use something directly from part one that will enable me to find maximum speed very, very quickly. I can say, like, when is maximum speed happening? And the answer is, maximum speed happens as you pass by the center of motion, right? Because you've been sort of accelerated back toward the, the, the center of motion. And then as you pass the center of motion, you are experiencing no acceleration. You're not speeding up, you're not slowing down. You can't get any faster than that. Um, and at that exact moment, you're not being slowed down. So that's where maximum speed occurs in the center of motion. But from part one, I know where the center of motion is. It's going to be as stated here at x equals two, um, because that's what shift has been introduced. So I can say maximum speed occurs at the center of motion which is x equals 2. The reason why that's useful is because you can go back to the very first expression that we were given here or equation I should say which is the velocity in terms of the displacement so I can just put x equals 2 into here do a straight substitution and that will give me a result that will help me get speed so let's go ahead and do that x equals 2, when I substitute that into the v squared equation, um, you can see there's going to be a 9 out the front, and then I've got 5 plus 4 times 2 is 8, 2 squared is 4. When I have a look at this, this is 13, take away 4 is 9, so I'm getting v squared equals 9 times 9, which is 81. From this, um, the reason why I've got a v squared, of course, by the way, is that velocity um, has direction built into it, right? So it can be either positive or negative. So strictly speaking, at x equals 2, which is the center of motion, am I going in the positive direction or the negative direction? And the answer is I could be going in either. So that's why this is ambiguity built into the question or into the equation, I should say. However, what we need to remember, and this is, again, um, a key point that some students struggle with, velocity is a vector. So it minds which uh, direction you are in, right? But we are not asked for velocity or maximum velocity, we are asked for maximum speed and speed is a scalar. Um, I think this is coincidental, but this is kind of convenient that it alliterates, right? Velocity is a vector, speed is a scalar, so therefore I can say, um, I can just not worry about which direction it's going in. If I take the square root of both sides, that gives me the absolute value on the left hand side and I just get the positive square root here of 81, which is nine. So I'm done, that's the, ma the maximum speed that I'm after. I should tie this up in a neat bow by providing units as well because the question did give that to me. Maximum speed is nine meters per second. Remembering back to the question's units. So that was only half of part two. The other half was to know the range of motion. Um, determine the interval that the particle moves through. So how do I do that? Well, what I can use, I mean, there's a couple of ways I should do this. I could do this, by the way, and I'll, I'll actually show you two. But the most straightforward way to do it is kind of pulling the same trick that I just did here with working out maximum speed. Um, where does maximum speed occur? Answer, at the center of motion. Where does, uh, where is the interval of motion defined by? And the answer is where you're kind of stopping, right? If you know where you're stationary, your extremities of motion, um, then you can just say, well, wherever those x values are, that is the interval that you move through. So I can say, at the extremities, the particle is stationary. Uh, in fact, I think it's so important to actually say that, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna write here, at the extremities, this is part of my reasoning, the particle is stationary. In other words, v is equal to zero. And I again can go back to the original equation provided to me and just um, solve that. In fact, I can even go less than solving. Um, if I say, well, the v squared equation is up here. There it is right there. I can say uh, this thing here is going to be equal to the velocity, which is zero squared. Right, So I can say IE, I'm dividing through by nine, of course, um, doesn't change anything. And while I'm dividing through by nine, you know what? Let's divide through by minus nine because that'll change this, um, this negative that's in front of the X squared, it'll change it into a, a monic uh, quadratic. So it's just gonna have a, a leading coefficient of one. So here I go dividing through by minus nine, it gives me an X squared minus four X minus five equals zero. Um, the factorization here is not too complicated. It's going to be x minus 5x plus 1. 
equals zero. So this tells me that the solution of this is x equals negative one or five. And that doesn't actually answer the question. I need to know the range of motion. So I just need to say that it's between x equals negative one and x equals five. So therefore, range of motion is, or the interval, um, they're saying the same thing, is negative one to five. Done. And I suppose you could use interval, interval notation here if you wanted, okay? Now, um, I did promise there was one other way that I thought made sense to do this. I don't like it as much, and the way that I just showed you was probably the least error prone and most likely to succeed. Um, but, you know, many approaches to this, and one of the great things about simple harmonic motion is that you can use some of the forms of um, the different equations that come out of simple harmonic motion to read off the attributes of the particular motion or the particular particle and how it moves that you're interested in, right? So if I just go back to the original equation, which was v squared equals 9 outside of 5 plus 4x minus x squared. Some of you may remember that I can do some factorizing and some completing the square here um, to make obvious uh, what's going on here with the motion without actually doing uh, this particular, uh, having this knowledge here that the, at the extremities of the particle is stationary, right? So what I can do here is inside the brackets, I'm going to um, break apart the five into um, two different numbers that allow me to complete the square um, because there should be a square, uh, sort of a quadratic coming out of this um, that's going to help me read off the center of motion and therefore and also the uh, amplitude of motion, right? So if you have a think about this, right? 4x minus x squared, what do I need to um, add or subtract to that in order to complete the square? And the answer is, if I put this in a more helpful order, right? Um, minus x squared plus 4x, in order to complete the square here, you're halving and squaring this middle coefficient, right? This is the, the b in the ax squared plus bx plus c, right? So when you halve and square it, you get 4. Um, but don't forget, this is actually going to be a minus 4, not a plus 4, because this whole quadratic is actually negative, right? So if I had a positive x squared, it'd be x squared minus 4x plus 4, um, but here I, I'm going to match the sign out the front. Now if there's a minus 4 there, um, it started with a 5, so how is this going to balance out? The answer is with a 9. Can you see there that uh, this 5, I can break it apart into that 9 and that, whoopsie daisy, um, that minus 4. 9 minus 4, last I checked, is equal to 5. Um, but the reason why this is useful is that now I can do that factorization and complete the square there in, in the middle. So I can go 9 outside of, uh, I'm going to write that next 9 as 3 squared, take away, and then let's just be careful here, this is going to be x plus, uh, x minus 2 rather, all squared, because in fact once I take this minus sign out, that becomes a minus 4x. Um, you can see why this is not the ideal method, there's a lot of minus signs and a lot of actual algebra manipulation that is unnecessary, you can see it was a lot easier um, to do up here. So just adding that cognitive load is just an extra confusion factor. So once you have um, I've done that, you can see here, um, this 3 here is actually going to be the amplitude, if you didn't remember that form, um, that's me reminding it, uh, reminding you of it. And this here, that x equals 2, is the center of motion that we identified back in part 1. So from that, I can say, um, therefore, that interval is going to be, um, it's going to be 2 minus 3, and it's going to be 2 plus 3. You can see there, there's the center of motion appearing there twice. And then you can go in the negative direction 3 and in the positive direction 3 because of that amplitude there. And hopefully it is pretty straightforward to see that that gives you the original result. Uh, not ideal. I think it, you're sort of asking to confuse yourself. Uh, but this, this math method is valid, so it works totally fine.